Open your Bibles to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, we're in our, um, in our series called Fruit of the Spirit, Internal Gospel Growth. I want to keep things somewhat in context. We've been talking about Galatia, uh, the book of Galatia to Galatians to the Galatia church. And um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll go through this series and we're going to jump into a series on why we do things here at King's. And we're going to go through the book of Jude. We'd like to do expository preaching um, in the fall. And then we are going to take a break around October and do a five-part series on the solas. Uh, if you have been coming out on Wednesday night, we're studying what is Reformed theology. So uh, we'll do that, and then uh, Christmas will be here. And I know you don't want to talk about Christmas. So we'll move on. Galatians 5. I want to read to you, um, I'm going to read to you Galatians 5, two verses. Um, there are other scriptures we're going to be looking at today. Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do. If not, there are Bibles back there. I do put the verses up, but... You should know your Bible. If you don't have one, we want you to have one. You can take one home with you. Um, and you find, if you can find Galatians in the New Testament, um, and then it actually goes backwards. So if Galatians, when we get to the verses, and then Philippians and Ephesians go uh, to the left of Colossians. So, But I just want to read one verse, two verses in Galatians, and then when we get to those verses, I'll read them. Save us some time. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, fruit of the Spirit. Look what it says. Hear the word of the Lord. Verse 22. But, it's in contrast to the works of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. May God add a blessing to the reading of that, his holy word this morning. So if you... Uh, if you have children, you could dismiss them now for children's church. There's some teachers back there, I'm sure. I know my wife's been preparing. And we are in Galatians. Now, we started this series uh, a few weeks ago. It's a 10-part series, uh, Fruit of the Spirit, Internal Gospel Growth. And we're looking at nine characteristics, nine characteristics of those who are justified by faith and who exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Now, I've used the word justify on purpose because, as you remember, just quickly, um, Paul is writing a letter to this church in Galatia, the Galatian church. Paul is the apostle who planted this young church and, rec and realizes that false teachers have been infiltrating the church that he planted, and they are preaching a false gospel. They are telling men and women in the church that you can be justified before God by faith in Jesus Christ and works of the law you've been there on Wednesday night, is the difference between necessity and sufficiency. They're saying it's necessary to believe in Christ, but it's not sufficient to believe in Christ. You must add the law. Now, to be justified, we said, it means to be declared forgiven, not guilty, before the judge and righteous. It's like a two-sided coin that we are forgiven, not guilty on one side, and then the other side, the perfect righteousness, the law-fulfilling work of Christ by faith, has been imputed or counted, depending on what word you want to use, on the believer's behalf. It's not our righteousness. It is the righteousness of Christ. And when we have faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit, uh, through the Holy Spirit, being born again, born anew, God's life in us, desires for us to live a life of Christ, living his life in us and through us. And Paul tells us in Galatia that the fruit of the Spirit cannot and will not be the result of living under the law. But if we're led by the Spirit, if, if we're walking in the Spirit, pressing in and applying the gospel to our hearts, it will produce fruit. So in other words, we cannot, will not be able to, to be accepted or approved and forgiven by our works, by our deeds... We can't, we can't gain God's approval. It's, it's not through our moral performance. It's what Christ has already done. And if we are living to try to justify our lives, justify and say, Lord, you must, you know, you must love me now because this is what I'm doing, and that's living under the law. But when by grace through faith we believe in Christ, we trust in Christ, we rely upon the Christ, the one who has fulfilled the law completely for us, that supernatural work of God takes place in us, and then we will bear the fruit of the Spirit. I've said this before. I'm going to say it every single week. There's a major difference between a morally restrained heart relying on the law based 
upon our works-based justification and the supernatural changed heart resting in the gospel in the sufficiency of Christ. So one heart is saying, I better not do this because then God won't love me and accept me. That's living under the law. That's a morally restrained heart. There's a difference between that heart and a supernatural heart that's been changed by the gospel, resting in the gospel, justified in the gospel. It's not my righteousness. It's his righteousness. It's not my moral performance. It's what Christ has done on my behalf. Big difference between the two. And the fruit of the Spirit, we said, grows like a cluster of grapes. Singular verb, singular now. The fruit of the Spirit is, not the fruits of the Spirit are. We said there are nine characteristics, that it grows internally. Remember that? So it's symmetrical and it's internal as we press the gospel deeper into our souls. They grow together. You can't, you can't have one grown without the other. They may grow at different stages or, or different you know, amounts, but they're growing together. It's not our temperament. It's God's DNA. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It's internal internal it's symmetrical and it's a process last week we look at the contrast between the deeds and the flesh the flesh is that part of us that wants to live in rebellion it's self-effort like a, like a, a device in a factory that works and produces a product versus the fruit that grows in us through us one has to do with labor and toil then one has to do with beauty and growth from from the inside and as we turn our attention now to the third fruit of the spirit called peace let, let, me, let me make some, some preliminary uh, remarks. First, many people have pointed out, rightfully so, that when the, fruit of the, the list of the fruit of the Spirit, the first three, has an upward attitude that we have toward God. It's an upward um, reality of our relationship and concerns an attitude toward God. Our first love is God. Because he loved us, we love him. Right, And that flows from a, a love that he already has for us. And our chief joy is our joy in God. So love comes from God. Joy comes from God. And our deepest peace is the peace with God. Love, joy, peace. And what I find interesting, we just finished the gospel according to John, is in John's gospel account, love, joy, and peace is found only in the Savior. Only in the Savior. John 15, he says, as the Father has loved me, I love you. Abide in my love. Abide in my love. You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandment. Abide in his love. John 15, as the, excuse me, John 17, Jesus praying, I made known to them your name, Father. He's talking, talking to the Father about us. I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. And I in them. Concerning joy. He said over and over, my joy will be in you, and my joy in you, your joy will be full. John 17, that they may have my joy. He's talking to the Father. Jesus has joy, and my joy may be in them and be fulfilled in them. Concerning peace, he says, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world do I give to you. Let your hearts not be troubled. Don't be afraid. John 16, 33, very well-known verse. I say these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I just find it interesting that I know the Holy Spirit is working the fruit of the Spirit. They're, they're intricately woven, woven together and, and can only happen as we abide in Christ, have a union with Christ. But nowhere does Jesus say, I will give you my patience, my patience be with you, or, or I will abide, or, or you know what, you need to abide in my self-control. But love, joy, and peace are found and given to us directly from Christ. It's my love in you. It's my joy in you. It's in me you will have peace. You know, those are three things that everyone's searching for. Love, joy, and peace. Love, joy, and peace. And when people search for it, they can't find it outside of Christ. I know all the other fruit of the Spirit is binding, but it's interesting, and you guys could talk about it in community group, on how those three characteristics is in Christ. The next thing I just want to mention, too, is a preliminary uh, statement. We haven't talked about this yet. The characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit is the characteristics of Christ. Is the characteristics of Christ himself. Because John, Romans 8 tells us that the work of the Spirit is to what? Transform us into the image of Christ. So when Jesus says, you know, greater love, knowing this, I lay down my life for his friend, he's saying, I love you. 
and he exhibits the fruit of the Spirit. He says he is uh, joyful in John 17. Um, Hebrews 12, Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising or disregarding the shame and sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, Isaiah. Jesus is my peace I will give to you. Jesus is the embodiment also, really, and shows the exhibits the fruit of the Spirit of kindness. Paul understood kindness. Titus, he tells Titus, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, not about us, but according to his own mercy. By the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I'm not sure if that's the right order, but that's nine. Nine. So that's Christ living in us. The fruit of the Spirit is his life. He exhibits the characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. Of course, he does it perfectly, right? So when we talk about peace, let's talk about it in three aspects. Upward, inward, and outward, all right? Pretty, pretty simple. Upward peace, our peace with God, inward peace, the peace of our own souls and our own heart, and then outward peace. I want to spend a few minutes talking about what it looks like for a gospel community or for the Prince of Peace to reign in the gospel community. There should be peace among brothers and sisters, right? Okay. If someone... Upward peace. If someone said to Paul, Paul, we got your letter. We've read it. How does one have peace with God? I think I can confidently say that Paul would say, peace is found in Jesus alone because the peace of God is the consequence of being justified by faith alone through Christ alone. Last week we talked about joy and how joy is the, is the heart's delight in that in which we treasure, what we glory in. We said that even in the midst of suffering and, and conflict, we can have joy because joy is based on the treasuring and the rejoicing in one's eternal redemption and identity in Jesus Christ, the gospel. Joy, we said, is the gladness that overflows from real satisfaction, real contentment in Christ because of re the redemption, the, the rescuing, and we belong to him, and, and, and sin, death, and hell have been conquered. The power has been broken in Christ. And as we, remember we talked about this last year, as we wonder in the gospel, as we rehearse the gospel, as we uh, deal with the reality and, and truth of the gospel, it arouses sustaining joy even in the midst of conflict. Joy is rooted in God. When we rehearse the gospel, wonder the gospel, redemption. But peace and joy, although they are similar... If you experience them in your life as the fruit, you know it as similar. They come from the same source, God himself, the power of the Spirit, but they're not the same. You see, peace brings joy to the heart when, when the heart is not tormented by anxiety, when the heart is not tormented by fear and inner conflict of one's being. A, a person can live in a very peaceful environment. Nobody can be home. you got the music playing. you got a beautiful outdoor surrounding. You could have serenity around you, but not peace within you. Everybody, right? You chase after this, this mental calmness, and, it, and, and, and it's short-lived. It's short-lived. But Christian peace, like joy, yes, it's something we feel, but Christian peace is rooted, listen, Christian peace is rooted in the objective peace of God that comes through Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1, you have it on the screen. Therefore, since we've been justified... Forgiven, not guilty, righteousness of Christ imputed to us. By faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. Maybe you've heard it before. Irene in the Greek. And shalom is more than just external peace. When, when the Hebrews use the word shalom, it, it's a state of wholeness. It's, it's harmony within the soul. It's not just... It's not just outward peace, it's inward peace, and it's relational peace. When they would greet each other, shalom, it was a desire that they would be, there would be peace around them, yes, but there was a well-being of the heart. That's what shalom means. The Jewish people know that the Jewish people know that in Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2, there was perfect shalom, right? Physical, psychological, emotional, relational peace. God was walking in the garden before sin entered the world. But when sin entered the world, fractured the shalom and they know that there will be no peace. Permanent 
shalom, until the Messiah comes. Until he establishes eternal kingdom in the fullness of the age. When Jesus, the Messiah, comes, who is the Prince of Peace. See, they were, they were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for this, with expectation of this messianic kingdom to come. And then Jesus inaugurates the kingdom with his death, well, his birth, death, burial, and resurrection. But until his return, sin has fractured the shalom of God on earth. But someday, it will not be the case. But when he came, he brought peace to the heart of sinners. Turn with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. I got verses 19 through 22 on the screen, but I, I want to reach a little bit more. It's such a beautiful passive scripture. Colossians 1, peace. Verse 15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers, authorities, all things were created through him, that's Jesus, and for him. Verse 17, and he, that's Jesus, before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. Not the pastor, not the people. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the beginning from the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn doesn't mean created being as the cults twist it. It talks about rule and sovereignty. Firstborn of the dead and that everything he might have preeminent. For in him, verse 19, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, that's Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth, in heaven, making peace, how? By the blood of his cross. And you, that's plural, that's y'all, me, you were alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy And blameless and above reproach before him. It's that entrance into the kingdom before the throne of God. Blameless, all right? Who who say they're blameless? I'm not, but it's through the cross. Blameless, above reproach before him. Now, just so you know, the word flesh there is the same Greek word, but has a different meaning depending on the context. When we're talking about the flesh in Galatians, we're talking about that rebellious nature of us. And I've used this sinful nature, the, that part of us that wants to live disobedient. In this text, obviously, the flesh that he's talking about is the body of Christ, the actual physical body of Jesus Christ. So just, I just want to put that out there. You've got to look at the, the context, okay? Now, the first thing we need to know, and you need to know this morning, is that all of us, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's going on in your life, job, family, kids, Uh, relation, whatever is going on in your life, the greatest need that you have and I have is reconciliation with God, our creator. We all need it. We all need it. And Paul says, and you, all of you, and this is the reason why we need it, we're once alienated. The word is estranged, dissociated, and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. You say, I'm not hostile in mind toward God. Yes, you are. In fact, the in fact, the very notion of I don't really care about God is hostile to God. You're either with him or against him. And apart from God's grace, the work of justification, all of us were strained. And not just alienated. Look what it says. It's hostile in our minds. We're at war with God. You say, but God loves me. Yeah, he loves you. But he's also repulsed by our sin. He's filled with indignation because of our rebellion. Even the oha attitude is sin and rebellion against God. It's cosmic treason. He created us. Romans 8, 7, the mind of sinful man is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It's, it's not just our attitude, it's our action, not just our thinking, it's our doing. And Paul is saying that this separation, this hostility with God, has a mediator. It, it, is, it is Christ who reestablishes this, this, this peace from this hostility between God and man. And here in the text, when you see in Colossians, Paul talks about, you know, blemishes, holy and blemished. And we may, we may, what does it say? Say, uh, we may uh, come before him unapproachable. You know, he who is unapproachable, we can now approach him. What, What Paul is doing in this text is reminding us of the sacrifice in the temple. He knows that sinful man can't enter into the temple of God. That's why there was sacrifice in the Old Testament. It was really a picture of us, how sinful we are. And there were sacrifices, there were sacrifices of blemished, 
uh, uh, blemished people and unblemished animals. And, and, and God was teaching the people, you can't come waltzing into the holiness of God. And you must come with an unblemished sacrifice. That's how wicked we are and that's how sinful we are. And the scripture says without uh, the blood there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood. So he's showing us that. And that's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about this, this unreconciled relationship with God. And, 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 and let, me just, let, me just, let me just speak to you for a minute. Some people are, and you may be here this morning... Riddled with anxiety, worry, and fear because you have never really came to the place of complete surrender to Christ. You know, you, you, you've come this far, but you're still working for your salvation. You still think you got this. And, and you can't put your finger on it. You just, you just know that I don't really have this peace that you're talking about. And, and let me tell you this morning that if that's you... That's God's kindness to you. It is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It is God's kindness and, and, and telling you, don't, you will not find peace in these things and that thing, whether it's a good thing that becomes an idol, whatever it is. And God is saying, you will find peace in me. It's his kindness that's leading you to the place of finally surrendering your heart, your life to him. It would be, it would be cruel for God to allow you to have his peace and still be separated from him. Does that make sense? Verse 20, and through him, Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Listen, we're sworn enemies of God. The only thing that all of us deserve is complete separation, unbearable wrath. Our relationship with our creator was irreconcilable until Jesus came and paid the price. And reconciles. That's what happened at Calvary. That's what it means to be a Christian. To have peace with God. Through the blood of the cross. To know. To know. Objectively that Jesus Christ is that blood sacrifice. Without blemish. Perfect. Without defect. Without fault. To be a Christian is not to try harder. Not to work toward your salvation, that's living under the law, but to solely rely on the sufficiency of the work of Christ in your place. In fact, in the Old Testament, some of you may know this, in a young Kippur, a day of atonement, the priest would take two unblemished lambs, goats, and, and one of them would be sacrificed to show the bloodiness and to shed the blood of, of, of the animal as an atonement for one sin. The other animal, he would confess the sins and send them off in the wilderness. Forgiveness means to be sent away. And that is, that is really symbolic of sinful people, unblemished animals, and this, and this transferring of our blemishes to that which is unblemished. That's exactly what Jesus did. He's unblemished. We're blemished. Our sin and guilt was transferred to him. His righteousness has been transferred to us. We've been credited by his Holy life and death and burial and resurrection. He got our dirt. And we got his righteousness. Paul says, reconcile all things to himself, making peace through the blood of his cross. Verse 22, he has now reconciled his body of flesh, that's his literal body, by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. You see, you can't walk into the presence of God. Alone, but you can go with Jesus. The enmity and the estrangement now has been taken care of. The holiness of God we can approach. How? Through the blood of Christ. Through his perfect life, through his forgiveness. And when the Holy Spirit comes in and, and, and living and dwelling with us, within us and pointing us to the beauty and glory of Christ and he's conforming us to the image of Christ because he's established this, this broken relationship now has been reconciled. By grace alone, through faith alone. You need to see that this morning. And then when that foundation of, of grace and mercy, now peace with God. We can have peace within. We can have peace among ourselves. Remember, it, it, it's a growing process. We're going to talk about this in a little more. But it, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a growing process that peace is replacing anxiety, fear, and worry. It's not temperament like, I, I don't really have any anxiety or worry because I just don't care. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. Right? It's not indifference, not apathy. 
It's objective reality of the healing work of Christ. Now, that's outward peace. Look at inward peace. Turn with me to Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice in the Lord. Where is our rejoicing? In the Lord. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer, everything in prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace, see it? Well, that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anxiety and worry, I think, could possibly be, especially with everything going on, the number one issue that we're dealing with. And I dare to say the number one sin we might be dealing with. Now, I'm talking to myself. I'm not trying to add any more anxiety. Why are you stressing me out now? You know what I mean? I, I, I'm not saying that. God forgives me and loves me, and I'm working toward growing the fruit of patience. Uh, excuse me, peace, patience too. Uh, peace with God, uh, inner peace with God. I know I have the objective truth, but there, I have anxieties and worries. We all do. And I'm, so what I'm saying is, if God says, do not worry, if Paul says, cast all, if Peter says, cast all your anxieties upon him, he's trying to tell us that, hey, I know what it's like. I have anxiety and worries too. But cast your anxiety, that's not, that's not like wishful thinking. It's a command. Cast, do not worry, Jesus says. Cast your, that's something we have to grow in. That's something we need to continually do. I'm not adding more stress. I'm just telling you, let's deal with it in, as a reality that we're not doing it. It's covered under the blood. I get that. But I know I have to remind myself that I need to what? Deal with my anxiety and worry. So, the Greek word for anxiety is interesting. It's actually two words put together. Mirazo, which means to separate and divide or draw in different directions. Separate, divide, draw in different directions. It's also the other word is nous, which is the Greek word for the mind. So the picture that's presented is that anxiety divides, it tears, it tears up the mind, it pulls the mind in different direction. The old English word, very interesting, means to strangle or to choke. That's what, that's what anxiety feels like, being choked, racked with worry. Now, Paul's not talking about genuine concern. Anybody has any kids? Genuine concern. You know, there's nothing wrong about being concerned about your future and having a 401k. There's nothing wrong about being concerned about your children's future as the college as they go. It's not, it's, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, I think I'm going to put up a, a fire detector in my home because, you know what, there could be a fire. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. Proverbs tells us in chapter 14, a simple man believes everything, anything, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. You see, anxiety and worry anticipates potential disasters in areas that we have no control over. We have no control over that. And we stress out over stuff that we have no control. And when we're riddled with anxiety, we're really saying, God, you're not able to take care of me. That my problems are bigger than your promises. Rather than resting in the sovereignty of God, who is not only sovereign God, but loving Father, in me you will have peace, Jesus said. the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, I'm saying that to you, and I'm saying it to my own soul. Someone once said, worry and anxiety is practical atheism. Rick Warren writes, worry is the warning light. Worry is the warning light that God is not really first in my life at this particular moment because worry says that God is not big enough to handle my problems, end quote. So, you know, don't raise your hand. I'll raise mine. I've been there. Paul's a realist. He knows. You can't just go, okay, I'm going to wake up. I'm not going to be anxious. Then you start being anxious about being anxious. You're like, oh, I'm stressed out. I'm starting to anxious. The Bible says don't worry. And I am worrying. Oh, my word. You know, by 11 o'clock in the morning, you're ready to crawl back into bed. That's not what I'm saying. Paul gives us, tells us what we need. It's not just uh, 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 will yourself. It says it begins with justification. I'm reconciled to God. Nothing I can do. He's done it all. I'm justified. And now what do we got to do? It says right here, prayer. Because we've been justified by faith and we have access now into the throne, we can come boldly before the throne of God. Our relationship went from estranged and, and broken and unreconciled to reconciliation. Now we're his children. 
He says, in everything, big things, small things, all things, needs, wants, worries, verse 6, in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I read that and I say, well, prayerlessness or prayerlessness guarantees anxiety. Prayerfulness is God's antidote for anxiety. So I'm going to ask you, don't raise your hand, but how many times are we worried and anxious about things and we haven't spent a good season of time in prayer? One pastor said this, pray so much about worry that worry has to take a number and stand in line. I like that. Prayer helps us to focus on the goodness and character, as we're, as we're praying in the scriptures, we're understanding the word of God. Prayer helps us focus on his sovereignty, his character, get to adore him and glorify him, be satisfied in him. It's amazing how when we spend time thinking and praying of the magnitude of God, that, that our, our problems seem to get smaller. We're meditating on the magnitude of God. We, it kind of puts things in its proper perspective. You know, it, it, it's, just, it's just prayer helps so much. And the word supplication has to do with um, earnest, heartfelt. It's a really cool word. It has, to, it has to do with just coming before God, just pouring out your heart to him. It's like he already knows you're riddled with anxiety and worry and you're anxious about something. Just pour out your heart before him. Some people don't do that. Thou is God shall, you know, it's like, lighten up. He already knows. Pray. Tell him how you're hurting. Tell him what the situation is. Spell it out to him, uh, what is strangling you. Leave it with him. We have a tendency to pray. I call it the Velcro prayer, right? Everybody's been down there. You get on your knees or wherever you are, and you're praying, and you feel so good. And then you walk away, boom, it sticks right back to you. Like, oh, man, I felt good about 10 seconds. I got to go back and pray. With thanksgiving, we have an attitude of gratitude. We're thankful all that God has done. We make our requests. We're specific. We're committed not to our personal agenda, but under the sovereignty and the sphere of Christ's lordship. We're trusting in God's love. Trusting in his sovereignty. And his peace will come, it says, flooding into our lives. Look what it says, transcends or surpasses all understanding. Isaiah 26.3, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast. Because he trusts in you. He says he'll guard our hearts and minds. The word guard is a military term. And what he's saying here is, listen, pray. You've been justified. Pray. Bring your supplications. Bring your prayers before God. Be thankful. Right? And he says it'll guard your hearts like a military outpost. When, 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 when the, the land was vulnerable and the guards came in and guarded the land, that which was vulnerable... What was, was, was given over to security. And he says, you know why? We have vulnerable hearts. Pray, trust, rely, and you will have his peace. The enemy is unable to get to us if God's peace protects us. It's a story. His name is Joseph Scriven, a man some of you may know. Um, he was born in 1819. I don't think any of you know him. But anyway... Uh, tough life. I read a story about him this week. He, he, he fell in love twice, two separate women, two separate times. Anyway, so he was getting married on, on his wedding day with his beloved. She gets into a, a terrible accident. I think she's thrown from a horse and she drowns while he's watching at the day of his wedding. A couple of years later go by, a couple, couple of years go by, finds another woman, loves her, they get engaged. Weeks before the, the, the marriage, she gets terminally ill, talking to 1800s, and dies before the wedding. He, 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 he runs to the scripture. He's, he's finding peace with God. He's working. We've all been that, right? We're working through the process. We're going through the, you know, the difficulties, the struggles that we all go through. He reaches the place of, of finding comfort in God, and he gets a note that his mother is dying She'll, very shortly. But he has no money because he took a, a, a vow of poverty. He has no money to go see his mother. And he's riddled again. He turns to prayer and then he writes these words. Uh, it says, a letter to his mother, the story of his life. And this is the words that he wrote to his mother. What a friend we have in Jesus. 
all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything through God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptation? Yeah. Is there trouble anywhere? Yep. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Yes. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Yes. Cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms, he'll take and shield you. You will find a solace there, if you know the song. Upward peace, inward peace, and outward peace. We'll end here, Ephesians chapter 2. Look with me at these verses. Therefore, okay, so Ephesians written uh, uh, as the supremacy of Christ. Therefore, uh, we know the verses, chapter 2, talks about grace through faith and not of works. It's a, it's a gift of God, and we know those verses, beautiful, wonderful verses. And then he says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called uncircumcision by what is called, by what is called a circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, Jew and Gentile. Remember that you were Gentiles at that time, look, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was our place. Verse 13, but now in Jesus Christ, you, that's the Gentiles, who were once far off, have been brought near, how? By the blood of Christ, for he, Jesus himself, is our peace, who has made us both, Jew and Gentile, one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that's the law, that he, may, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two. Again, here we go. So making peace between the two and might reconcile us both, Jew and Gentile, to God in one body through the cross, cross thereby killing the hostility. Okay? It's a mouthful, I know. Peace with God and the peace of God creates a peace that is evident in the new community, in the new man, in the new humanity. That's what he's saying. Tim Keller tells a story about a woman who was, uh, lived in poverty, very, very poor, nickels and dimes. And somebody came to her and found out who she was and told her that she had just inherited $10 million. True story. She really did. She believed him, but she didn't do anything about it. She didn't do nothing about it. She didn't give the money away. She, didn't, she had no concept of what that was all about that, about, that kind of amount of money. And she died poor. He says, some of us are doing the same things. Because sometimes we see what the church should look like as we read the scripture. And we think, that's not the church. That's the, I don't see that happening. Or maybe you've been hurt deeply by someone in the church. And you have not forgiven and moved beyond that. And what he says is, we're like that woman living in poverty. Because we're not connected to see the wealth of what it means to be connected with one another and living out this new gospel community that Christ has made. The church is much more than just than awesome and great good music and a mediocre long sermon. It's much more than that. The gathering of God's people in the gospel produced this countercultural and beautiful picture of the coming kingdom where there is ultimate peace. People get along with others and, and live life together. I would never do that outside the community of God's people. I mean, there's a lot we can say about this text, but first let's look at Paul is talking about Jew and Gentile. Paul was ministering to Jewish Christians. Uh, excuse me, to, he was a Jewish Christian ministering to the Gentiles. He talks about the circumcised, the uncircumcised. He talks about the dividing wall between them, verse 14. He himself is our peace. He broke down in the flesh, the dividing wall of hostility, verse 16. 
by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in its ordinances. So what he's saying is the Jews were given the law. They were called out of slavery. They were, they were sent, into the prom, uh, sent into the desert. God called the people to himself by grace and love. They didn't deserve it. And then he gives them the law, and he says, listen, I'm giving you the law because I want you to be separate from that world, sin, and I want you to be devoted to me. Okay? And, and, and they were to do that, they were set apart for God, set apart from the world to be a light and salt. His, his reflection of his glory to the nations. And the love and beauty and forgiveness of God that was shown to them was supposed to propel them on mission to the world. And Paul points out here in many other places that when you are called out of darkness, there are times that you are called out from that. You have given the law and it caused pride. In the human heart. It, it, there was a sense of superiority on the people's part. And let's not judge them. Let's relate to them. Because the human heart unaided by the gospel. Will produce pride not mission. That's the heart of racism and superiority. And the next thing you know when we feel. Oh I've been called. I've been said. You know all of a sudden we're despising one another. That's what he's talking about. We look down at our nose. and the actual In the temple there's an actual wall. As you get closer to the Holy of Holies, uh, where the, 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 the face of God, the Shekinah glory, there was a wall, Gentiles on this side, and closer to the Holy of Holies where the Jews were allowed to worship. So if you're a Gentile, you had to stay outside of that place. Pride, though, pride and not mission is expressed in enmity and hostility. That's why the world has no peace. We're better than you. Again, Dr. Keller writes this, the natural tendency, this is so true, the natural tendency of the human heart is to rejoice in those things that make us better than other people. And as a result, the peace is gone. The more self-worth you have apart from Christ, living in the law, the harder it is for you to get along with certain people, people who aren't as artistic as you, maybe they're not as wise as you, etc., 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 end quote. There's no way to have peace among ourselves when we're selfish and, and our hearts are hard and we are not pressing in the truth of the gospel. Maybe we're not getting along. Maybe you're not getting along. Maybe because we have forgotten the cross. Well, how does the peace, how does peace come by the way of the cross? I'll tell you how. It's a leveling field. It levels everything. It levels everything. Everything. You may have a different story. You may have a different, um, you probably have a different story and come a certain way, but all of us come to the bloody cross if you're a Christian. Period. We come the same way. The cross removes any kind of superiority. The gospel gives us a true understanding of ourselves. When we look at the cross, we see its bloody work of Christ. And we look at the cross and we see how loved and treasured we are. And the view of ourselves needs to go in that direction. The flesh, our self-justification must be eradicated. And, and to the level that I still am earning my, my self-worth, look how good I am, or look how much I failed, to that will come enmity and hostility, not peace among brothers and sisters. We're all saved by grace through faith alone. We can have confidence in what Christ has done, but there has to be a humility recognizing that the person sitting next to you came the same way you came, through the bloody cross of Christ. So if we offended someone or someone has offended us, it happens in community. Community can be, community can be um, messy. And we think, how much Christ has forgiven me and all the offense against him. When we have certain ideas of what people should be doing, shouldn't be doing, maybe not working as hard, we're a work person, or maybe they're not this, they're not that, and we're really just being, we're just putting ourselves in the place of God and not resting in the gospel. I am just as much a sinner and just as undeserving as Christ's love than everybody else, but he loves us anyway. To preach the gospel to ourselves, what Paul calls boasting in the cross. We ought to boast in the cross. For even those in Galatians, he says, even those who are circumcised do not, do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in the flesh, in the things that they earn. And keeping the law, Paul was 
Apostle Paul was a man who, who kept the law. He said, blameless, but I give it all for the knowing Christ. He says, far be it from me that I should boast in anything but the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts. Now listen, Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, Jew and Greek, but a new creation. That's the new humanity. That's the new man. So we could boast in ourselves and feel superior. We can boast in the law and try to work toward that and feel inferior. But when we boast in the cross, we're humble and confident. The only reason I have real, permanent, lasting peace with God and escaped hell is because of the mercy of God. And if that's the case, then you know what? I won't look down on you. You dress funny. You, you, you have certain things I wouldn't do. You, have, you dress a certain way. You may not be as smart, as much money or whatever. The cross levels that in the church. We all come the same way. The only hope that you and I have is Christ who died for us. And Paul says that levels everyone. Our hearts are desperately wicked. And maybe, maybe I said this in the first service. If you feel superior, think this way. Think about this. We're, we're going we're gonna to put a camera on your forehead. And we're going to put a radio in your heart to determine your motives, what you've done and what motives you had all week long. And then we're going to gather on Friday night and we're going to show it on the screen. Anybody up for it? We all come the same way. We all come the same way. If you remember, we boast in the cross. Sinners saved by grace. Deeply loved. Drink from the same spirit. Harmony and community. Church is not just a building, it's a community who drinks from the same spirit, who, who, who lives out of an already justified heart by grace through faith, who relies not on the works of the law to be made right, but on grace alone. And the church should look that way with each other. Let me end with this story. We're going to sing a song in a minute called, It Is Well With My Soul. The band can come up. But let me remind you for everybody else, one more minute. There was a man by the name of Horatio Spofford, you may know him. He was a wealthy Christian and Chicago lawyer. He had a nice home, a wife, four daughters, a son. And at the height of his financial professional success, him and his wife, Anna, uh, suffered the loss of their son. Shortly after that, on October 8, 1871, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed much of his real estate. Only two years later, he sent his wife and his four daughters to Europe. He Stayed in Chicago, he had some finished, finished business he had to do. After a couple of days, the ship that carried his wife and his four daughters sank. All four of his children drowned, only his wife survived. With a heavy heart, Spofford boated, took, jumped on a boat himself and took it to England to visit with his wife, Anna, who was grieving. And it was on that trip that he penned these famous words. When sorrow like sea billows roll, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. You know, but in the midst of this tragic and, and great horrific tragedy, you know what gave him the most comfort? We know. Because as he stood on that boat and he looked out over the sea that swallowed up his four daughters, he wrote this. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. All his sin, all our sins, past, present, and future, has been swallowed up by the Lord Jesus Christ. His heart rested and his peace was in the gospel. Difficulty and tragedy family comes to us. I recognize that. But I'm saying that in the midst of this broken and jacked up world, we know and we could recognize, even in our utter helplessness and sinfulness, that Jesus Christ conquered sin, death, and hell and is sovereign reigning. And we are now in a loved, reconciled relationship with him. Oh, it is well with my soul. I don't have the reasons bad stuff happens, but I do know that God is ultimately in charge. He is sovereign, and he destroys sin, death, and hell. And when Christ reconciled us to God, now lend here, listen, 
When God reconciled us to God by the blood of his cross, he granted us peace with God, and we now have the peace of God. His purposes are always loving. He is sovereign. He is always working for his glory, our joy. We grow when we understand that. We recognize the provision of the gospel, remembering all that he did, and we pray, and we rest in his peace. And reconciliation and the Spirit of God, listen, will produce the fruit of the Spirit in us. And it will be seen as we live in harmony in the new gospel community. Father, thank you for granting us access to you. Only through the blood of the cross. We could never earn it. We will never pay it back. It was paid for. Fully and completely by the Lord Jesus Christ. Sink that into our brains. Pour it out into our hearts. That we may love you in response to all that you have done in granting us peace. And Father we pray that when we worry and we have anxieties. We will cast them upon you because as Peter said you care for us. And Lord help us to work that out in community. Living in the gospel together encouraging one another, strengthening one another, and living in peace with one another so that others will see the beauty and glory of Christ in not only our lives but in the life of our community. For your glory, our joy, in Jesus' name.